Uh, first of all, it's in prose. Second, it occupies about a half page. Third, the sentences are extremely blunt and um, graceless. Antony having done the full Ciceronian thing, you see, Brutus then comes in as, as the, ma as the uh, hard-headed man of few words. And the audience is meant to pick up, but this is a... Um, in some ways, the contrast is to Brutus's advantage. But you can see why Antony swayed the crowd. That's what the audience is supposed to see. There's a nice example earlier in the play, the same play, Julius Caesar, where Cassius is trying to recruit Brutus as a, um, as a fellow terrorist. And he, um, <coughs> he begins like this. I cannot tell what you or any man think of this time, but for my single self I had as leave not be, as lived to be in awe of such a thing as I myself. You see that elaborate verbal balance with the self, self, and the BB? Uh, <clears throat> I say it again. I cannot tell what you or other men think of this time. But for my single self, I had as lived not be, as lived to be in awe of such a thing as I myself. And then he goes on, such a thing as I myself, Caesar. I was born free as Caesar, so are you, and so on. This oration goes on with a couple of interruptions for approximately three pages of text. And then Brutus, having taken it all in, nodding his head, responds as follows. <coughs> um, what you have said I will consider. What you have to say I will with patience hear. And find a time fit both to hear and answer such high things. You see, the, um, you see the stylistic disparity? And it's, uh, again, Brutus is the, the man with the short sentences and the obvious antitheses. Uh, my point is not uh, anything to do with Shakespeare's art. It has to do with the fact that the audience would have understood what was going on. And they, would have, they would have perceived that there were opposed definitions of style here, that these definitions of style had some kind of moral content about which there might be disagreement, but they had moral content and practical content. And it's perfectly clear always that the copious style is the one that works. When Cassius has done his big, his big oration, Brutus goes along with the conspiracy. When Antony does his big oration, he's the one who carries the crowd, and so on. Yet that's the one that always works. <coughs> and we, on the other side of the Cartesian revolution, um, I have to find the whole thing a bit unreal. We have to, uh, we have to work our way back into the notion of these words having any persuasive force at all. Shakespeare is a good source of symptoms. Think of, um, think of that moment when Polonius begins, um, begins elaborating a verbal cat's cradle and somebody says more matter and less art. Uh, here, here again you have a... Uh, the point is, it's a, it's a formula that the Playhouse audience would find familiar. But there's an antithesis here between uh, matter and art. And it's possible to find the art utterly vacuous and um, request a superior helping of matter, more matter and less art. As Polonius would have been perceived by a good deal of the audience as um, kind of um, <coughs> Ciceronian residue. <laughs> um, strictly a word man, a, a, maker, a, maker of, a maker of word patterns, which are um, a bit like uh, paper doilies. One <coughs> One, wonderful, wonderfully intricate workmanship, but they're not much use. 
they don't, when they don't tell you anything. <coughs> I'm going to shut that up for a few minutes. And up. <laughs> From the uh, omniscient, uh, author-oriented literary discourse, mm -hmm. um, authors, I'm thinking, beginning with Flaubert, yes. uh, try to uh, find devices in which to uh, imitate the, the intonations, um, the uh, angers, the, 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 uh, the movements of, of, of the spoken language uh, in, in the character-oriented new literary prose. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, and of course you end up with, with, uh, with the various devices uh, ending with, with Joyce and, and the monologue. Um, yeah, really. well, uh, yeah, um, because Flaubert also, you, you spoke of uh, the uh, Ciceronian model, attempting to imitate what sounds good. If you know Flaubert, mm -hmm. uh, quite often he speak aloud. Yes. Uh, he used what he called his gueuloir. Uh, he would shout out, he would speak out sentences to make sure that they sounded before he wrote them down. Mm -hmm. This kind of, uh, and this I think can be probably. And to make sure that they would not be ambiguous when they were written down. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. well, that's, that would be one, one of his mm -hmm. reasons, yes. Uh, I, I, def I defer to authority on anything to do with the development of French. <laughs> Which is a, where the where the notions of norms are always so different from the from the ones in English, aren't they? Um, let's uh, see. So we can we can approach that uh, we can approach that in English um, uh, rather interestingly, because uh, one of the things that um, Cole is pointing out in that essay on the Baroque style is that what the um, what the the anti-Ciceronians were trying to do, instead of making these beautifully symmetrical Christmas tree ornaments, was give some kind of indication of the, the workings of the mind coming upon a truth, and being surprised by that truth, and um, thinking of consequences of it. That's one reason you get these unjammed clauses toward the end of a sentence, uh, in which one, one thing is quickly leading to another. Uh, it, the, the phrase is used repeatedly, they, that they, we're getting uh, the, a rendition of the working of the mind. Now, the, the, the best, some of the best Senecan prose in English, oddly enough, is in Ulysses, and for exactly that reason. Ineluctable modality of the visible, at least that if no more, colon, thought through my eyes. See, that's a Seneca sentence. Signatures of all things I am here to read, colon, sea spawn and sea rock, this nearing tide, that rusted boot, and so on. The opening of Proteus is, um, it's pure, it's pure distilled 17th century Seneca prose. <laughs> And the, um, the notion of another criterion, which I didn't mention, Quill uh, uh, points out that there is a tendency in writing the Seneca prose to begin with the conclusion, the, the, the big idea. Put it right at the beginning and put it in the most aphoristic form you can. And then in, after the various semicolons, you're, uh, you're rotating it and looking and um, re looking at it in different aspects and with, with the aid of different metaphors. But it, it's there. Uh, this, uh, this, of course, Joyce reproduces by um, his, continual, his continual inversion of road order, particularly in the case of Leopold Bloom, so that the sentence would begin with the noun that Bloom, that Bloom sees or is thinking of. Instead of saying, I have the potato, he would say, potato I have. Because that, after all, potato is the first thing that surfaces. He actually felt it in his pocket, his potato, I have. That's not the normal order of English prose, but it's the order of Baroque prose, where you, um, you begin with the instance, 
and then you move to the um, uh, qualifications and the, uh, and the uh, predications. <coughs> but th this, um, this seems so revolutionary when Joyce does it. How conscious he could have, he could have been of um, writing, of uh, deriving models from the 17th century, I simply don't know. But it seems so revolutionary because the English novel, when it gets started in the um, 18th century, and of course has its great heyday in the 19th, is so entangled with the drama. Partly because the greatest writer in the language is William Shakespeare. <laughs> and the, the novelist is always apt to think of himself as a hand-me-down Shakespeare. Uh, the result is that the um, incentive to make dialogue sound realistic has never been very high. Uh, the incentive has rather been to make it sound eloquent. And it, it's surprising how many, speech, how many speeches in Dickens really are indeed speeches. It's surprising how consistently the earlier English novelists, here Walter Scott is a beautiful example, are apt to think of what they're doing as setting up an empty stage, <laughs> equipping it with scenery, putting actors there, putting costumes on the actors, and then letting them talk. In that order. <laughs> I had a high school teacher who used to say that he wanted us all to be in love with Walter Scott. And to that end, we were always to skip the first 50 pages. <laughs> because what was going on in the first 50 pages was all this uh, get making the theater ready. And that, it really is something like that. Um, <coughs> the, um, the, the result is that for the Victorian novelists, the criteria, the criteria of dialogue are much more theatrical than they are um, uh, notational. Given the radical unreality of his people, the dialogue of Henry James is probably more realistic than that of Thackeray. Because if such people could exist, they would talk like that. <laughs> and James is, James is perfectly aware that people don't talk in complete sentences, for one thing. And he, um, if, you look at, um, if you look at that chapter in The Ambassadors, um, I think it's about chapter 15, the, the, the big interview between Strother and uh, Madame de Vianney, the uh, fast Parisian lady who is um, leading New England youth astray, <coughs> they arrive at a pretty good understanding of one another, but it's surprising how few of the spoken sentences are really completed. And James, James, is, qu James is quite aware of, of two things. One, that people in conversation don't complete sentences, don't complete their sentences, Two, that um, terribly perceptive people wouldn't have to complete their sentences. They would just uh, virtually state a subject and the, um, the antennae would pick it up. And the, of course we all know that when, uh, when Joyce came along, he was, he was thought of as some kind of barbarian because the dialogue uh, the, the interior monologue in particular seems so asyntactic, but it's, um, it's generally based on, on, on a number of very simple and obvious rules. One is that the, the clause starts with the sensory perception, potato I have. Um, <coughs> another is that sentences don't need to be finished. Another is that, one, that there can be a kind of um, subtext that allows one thing to lead to another by, a, by an invisible transition. But I, th I think the reason, that, the reason that is also novel is that the, um, the Victorian novelists did not really try to reproduce speech. They, they, um, 
they had they had invented their own set of conventions for the way characters in novels talk, and the way characters in novels talk was a was not really a language that anyone spoke. Uh, what the background of Flaubert is, I, I don't know. What uh, what was the state of the French literary dialogue before him? Speech of okay, well, well, it's a, well, it's a, very, a rather similar situation, isn't taken it? Taken over, uh, you know, mm -hmm. into almost all European literature. It's a rather similar situation, isn't it? We, the tendency of people to make, um, if not Ciceronian, then certainly Cartesian speeches to one another. Um, but isn't a sentence like potato I have precisely just a sensory perception and not, not a verbalization? Well, potato is a sensory perception, but I have uh, add something to it. You see, he's just noticed that he doesn't have his keys. He's feeling in his pockets. He's about to leave the house. He chucks for the key. The key isn't there, but the potato is. Potato I have. But the key is upstairs. No, it's not just the sensory perception, but it begins with the, with the sensory perception. No, but it's unspoken. It is unspoken, yes. Uh, when, Bloom, uh, when Bloom speaks, he, um, he speaks with a rather stilted politeness. But when he's, uh, when he's talking to himself, that's the movement of the mind. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got the paragraph in call about that because it's interesting. Um, <coughs> ah, yeah, here we are. The the um, what the the men who developed the the uh, the, the uh, Seneca star who include, by the way, Montaigne and Pascal. As well as, uh, in France, as well as Burton and Brown in English, sometimes led by dislike of formality into too licentious of freedom, yet even their extravagance is our purpose of, and express a creed that is at the same time philosophical and artistic. Their purpose was to portray not a thought but a mind thinking, or in Pascal's words, a peinture de la pensée. They knew that an idea separated from the act of experiencing it is not an idea that was experienced, as it's become disembodied. The order of its conception in the mind is a necessary part of its truth, unless it can be conveyed to another mind in something of the form of its occurrence. Either it has changed into some other idea, or it has ceased to be an idea, or ceased to have any existence whatever except the verbal one. Now, that, doesn't that sound remarkably like um, like a description of an interior monologue, with emphasis on the actual working of the mind as it um, as it experiences what it experiences and arrives at the ideas it arrives at, and takes pleasure or the reverse in those ideas having arrived at them. <coughs> um, ah. The Ciceronian, they felt that the Ciceronians, I'm going to paraphrase the middle of this just to shorten it. Uh, these people felt that the Ciceronians um, turned everything into pure, verbal, into pure verbalism, removing the idea from experience. For themselves, they preferred to present the truth of experience in a less concocted form and deliberately chose as a moment of expression that in which the idea first clearly objectifies itself in the mind, in which, therefore, each of its parts still preserves its own peculiar emphasis and an independent vigor of its own, in brief, the moment in which truth is still imagined, <coughs> italics. It's after you've skimmed off that layer of uh, imagined that you begin to get abstraction. So, um, <coughs> he has more to say, but I'm, 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 trying to, I'm trying to account for the fact that the, um, that the style of, um, of interior monologue and even of much realistic dialogue 
is apt to follow the norms that uh, Quill is describing for the um, 17th century Sen uh, Senecans. And of course, the mention of Montaigne is a tip-off, isn't it? Where you have the man who is, whose essays are not, after all, abstract systems. They're very, they're very much, uh, they're very much uh, inseparable from his, from his individuality. They are part of his intellectual experience, as distinguished from the. <coughs> from the lightning rod salesman who comes along and has a system for you. Now, I think you know, the um, relationship to speech is uh, it's something that comes surprisingly late, particularly the notion that speech can somehow be actually represented, that you can write out something that will look as though people were saying it. It's surprising how late that is, and one, one reason it's late is the resistance to writing out sentences that are going to look disheveled and unfinished. I, I'm, I think it's just about that simple. And the other, the other in English, this is, true, this is true in English, I don't believe it's true in French or German. You have that bedeviling circumstance, which I think I've mentioned to you before, of uh, the, the special notions of elegance which were introduced after the Norman Conquest and which involved a kind of hybrid diction in which you didn't go into a house but you gained admission to it. And this was, and this was entangled with the idea that that is the language you're supposed to write. The written language the written language in English has had a special habit of separating itself from the spoken by getting into a special domain of, of diction where, where you gain admittance. A thing people never do when they open their mouths. When they open their mouths they say they got in. <coughs> Elliot has a wonderful sentence about a um, about a British workman in a, in a pub who can talk beautifully but then he decides to write a letter to the editor and he produces something in no known language decorated with words like maelstrom and catastrophe <laughs> decorated with words like maelstrom and catastrophe <laughs> And no, no known language is correct. It's a curious hybrid of, um, of Saxon grammar and um, imported nouns. I always start to pertain to the written language. There's a beautiful parody of it in Ulysses. The, um, the Eumaeus episode, it's the one where Stephen and Bloom go to the cabman's shelter what is going on in that episode is that Bloom is being granted the courtesy of an episode written as he would write it. He is in fact being allowed, as it were, to hold the pen. And it begins, preparatory to anything else. <laughs> <laughs> and goes on in that fashion. And the sentences meander in the most fascinating way. This has been totally misexplained for years as tired, as a tired episode. It is not tired. There is nobody at Harvard who could write it. I don't think anything costs us more trouble than, that, than to synthesize that baroque awfulness and keep it up for 40 pages. Preparatory to anything else, Mr. Bloom brushed off the bulk of the shavings from his companion in orthodox Samaritan fashion, which he very badly needed. <laughs> <laughs> I like orthodox Samaritan, when the act is being performed by a Jew. If you remember the point of the parable of the good Samaritan. <laughs> it goes on and on like that. A man named Anthony, um, 
Anthony Cronin in Dublin told me that the um, style of Eumaeus was based on the style of Irish provincial newspapers at the turn of the century. Papers like the Kilkenny People. Apparently they were all written in that idiom. They always said preparatory to anything else. <coughs> you recognize this superstition, don't you, that the written language is something special. First of all, you pick up the pen, then you revolve it three or four times and lower it toward the paper. Well, you don't do that, but you've seen people do it. I've watched with fascination the um, proprietor of the Santa Barbara, California Animal Shelter filling out a receipt for a cat. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the ballpoint went slowly down, toward, slowly down toward the paper, revolving in circles in the air until it impacted. <laughs> then it began to revolve in the other direction. <laughs> And if he had been doing anything but filling out a form, the Dixon would have executed comparable gyrations. Does that throw any light on your question at all? Well, I, I wish we would. But the, uh, I, I do think the whole, I do think the relationship of the spoken language is one that is one that. Um, finds ways to establish itself extremely late. It's partly because the, um, partly because so much uh, Renaissance prose obeyed the conventions of oratory, you see. Which, while it is spoken, is not the spoken language in the sense in which we're using it, or in which Flaubert was using it. In fact, Flaubert is very conscious of that distinction, isn't he? Uh, what uh, a, a certain pomposity that occurs whenever somebody begins to make a speech. A theme that gives Dickens trouble, you see, because he has difficulty segregating it from um, normal dialogue. You raised a question about uh, information in them. Um, yes, the map. I was generalizing about information being a late arrival, and it's been pointed out that the marvels of Britain is um, information after a, after a sort. In Britain, <coughs> be many wonders. Nevertheless, four be most, be most wonderful. Um, there's information on that page. I don't know if I want to trust it or not, but it's <laughs> it's going through the motions of information. I, I notice that it begins, however, with a it begins, however, with a, with a um, with a taxonomy. There are many wonders in Britain, but four are most wonderful. And then you you can see the rudiments of somebody making a case right away. He's going to establish that these are the big four. <laughs> now he makes it with the aid of information. Yes, he does. He tells you things about those wonders. Um, there's, a, there's a rhetorical term for that. I can't think of it at the moment. Where the, the information that you introduce in order to clinch a point. The exam exemplum. The, ex the, ex the exemplum. <coughs> it's a little different from um, it's a little different from setting out to write a prose that will be controlled by its information, you see. This is being controlled by its, um, um, its value system. Four are most wonderful. The first is a pictum. There bloweth so strong a wind out of the sins of the earth that it casteth up any clothes that men casteth in. The second is at Stonehenge beside Salisbury. There great stones and wonder huge be reared on high. But you notice the amount of uh, you notice the amount of evaluative language there. Great stones and wonders huge be reared on high. I don't get a very clear picture of Stonehenge from that. 
I, I get the, uh, the information that's conveyed to me is that if I went to Stonehenge, I would see something pretty exciting. But I don't quite know what. <laughs> Uh, is, this, uh, is this distinction clear, or does it seem um, like fancy? You don't like it? No. No, it seems to me that um, it's the same kind of verifiable, even though not, not the experience you would have before mm -hmm. Stonehenge, but Stonehenge is there. Um, is that... Um, is that, ver is, that, is that verifiable, if, if, you go, if you go to a certain place, you'll have a thrill? I'm putting, I'm putting this in the crudest terms I can. That's, uh, he's saying a little more than that. It has to do with stones. Seems to me verifiable information would... Um no, that's what I meant. That part of it isn't verifiable. Oh, okay. Okay, I misunderstood you. <laughs> but the, mar the marble... At least Stonehenge, mm -hmm. physicality remains there. As he says, he didn't. He doesn't say that man. It, it throws back uh, that pectine throws back the clothes that man cast in. Mm -hmm. He says that me cast it in, as if he's actually gone there and tried it out himself. <clears throat> Great stones and wonders huge, as it were gates, so that there seemeth gates is set upon other gates. That is, that is an effort to convey the idea of the, um, the, of the stone arts, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was ever accurate. It suggests that there are two layers. Um. <coughs> well, when you suggested in the second class that everything that goes does either falls under um, listing or telling a story. Either, a list, either making a list or telling a story, but I didn't say a list of what. But what is the description? <laughs> Um, this is uh, this is essentially list prose, isn't it? Would, would you would you agree with that? Essentially, essentially list. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. <coughs> this is a, this is essentially list list prose. Um, presenting, for one thing, the difficulties of organization that lists always do present. The one nice thing about narrative is that it tells you what to say next. The, the, um, the chronological sequence controls it. When, um, when, you are, um, when you're laying out, as this paragraph seems to me to be doing, a list of, um, I don't know what, marvelous, subdivided, One of the problems the writer is having is um, knowing, wh knowing in what order to put things, knowing what to say next, knowing when he's finished with Stonehenge. <laughs> and he stops rather abruptly, doesn't he, and then says the third is at Third Hall. There are great, there is great hollows under earth. Often many men have it. Uh, it be therein, and he walked about within, and these rivers and streams, but nowhere cometh they find none end. I don't trust that at all. <laughs> Here you're being told about a you're being told about a marvel in Britain where you can go underground and explore these underground streams, and they go on forever and without end. Um. Is this information? <laughs> it goes through the motions of being information. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think if you tried to verify it, you'd be in trouble. Um, a great. Mm. And down underground there is a great pond that containeth three score islands convenable for men to draw in. That is a marvel of Britain if it, if it, if it exists. <laughs> I'm, 
I'm a little reluctant to grant this the status of information, in part because I suspect a great deal of fantasy has gotten into it, don't you? Well, yeah, that's the problem. The marvels of Britain. Yes, and the red marvels is the uh, <laughs> is the key word. Now, it's now up to him to produce marvels. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you may think, I'm not trying to twist your arm. I'm trying, to, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get you to see what's going on here. When somebody says the marvels of Britain, he has in effect uh, offered to defend the thesis. You see, they're having to do with the presence of marvels of Britain worth paying attention to. He then says there are four, there are a lot of them, but there are four principal ones. That's the sub-thesis. These are the big four. Then he has to um, make each of these sounds sufficiently impressive to be, um, to be worth attention. <laughs> and it seems to me, it se it seems to me um, that it moves off into pure fantasy by the, uh, by the, by the, middle, of, by the middle of the second paragraph. Even though you, ha you have the rhetoric of information structures, you don't have the, the responsibility to the verifiable. Let's, let's put it this way. Father Orange tested the financial newsletter. Would, uh, would you put money on this? <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> I don't think it's just because I, I, I have a, a sneaking sense that I know more about England than he does. I think there's, there's something about it that tells you um, this is great. Um, uh, this is a great armchair um, travelogue. <laughs> now, the, the book about uh, the, the book about instructions for foreign travel. I think that I think there you are, you'd be on stronger ground because here you have the instruction manual, and the decorum of the instruction manual says this can be verified. That's what all, all instruction manuals really say. That they. They say, if you, if you follow these instructions, you won't get a sock. And the, and the washing machine will work. Similarly, um, really, uh, seriously, if you follow my instructions, you can travel through Spain and nobody will stab you. Because for one thing, I'm telling you what are dangerous topics of conversation, and you'll have the sense not to, not to bring them up. This is all very practical. Now, I think we've gotten, we've really gotten the hard information here, and um, he's putting it on the line in the, in the sense that he's inviting you to verify it, if you have the budget. This is the, uh, and this is, this is a manual for wealthy young men who want to see a bit of Europe before they settle down to whatever dull thing they're going to settle down to. <laughs> and in Spain, he must be much more careful of his diet, abstemious from fruit. And if you don't believe me, eat fruit in Spain, see what happens. <laughs> see? Uh, more reserved than cutlass in his discourse, entertain none at all touching religion unless it be with silence. And so on. Now, I think there's a difference between the instructions in foreign travel and the, one, and the marvels of Britain. And that the, the 1642 one really is asking to be verified. And is um, quite confident that there won't be any lawsuits if people, <laughs> if people do verify it. <laughs> but I, I don't think the marvels of Britain man is... Um, laying his reputation on the line in quite that way. But the distinction between the useful book and the um, armchair travelogue has not yet defined itself. Most of this material is conventional and legendary. One of, uh, uh, geographical marvels always include underground rivers. They run through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. That's, you know that. Coleridge knew it. Um,
Then you hear about, about salt wells connected to the sea that are salt all the week long till Saturday noon, and then they're fresh from Saturday noon till Monday. So we have the, we have the salt wells observing the Sabbath. Well, those are the most edifying salt wells I've ever heard of. And I don't believe a word of it. <laughs> Now the next thing is, did he believe it? And I really don't think the question can be, can be um, intelligibly formulated. The notion of belief is not, <clears throat> the notion of belief in your own statements is not here. This is um, a mixture of um, fact, fantasy, conventional, conventional marvelous material, um, If you were given the assignment to write a piece on the marvels of, of an imaginary country, it could come out rather like this. You might as well call it Britain. I think if you compare those two, you can see something has happened. Yeah. And that it is the 1642 one that has, that has really discovered verifiability and is offering, is really offering you a useful book in the sense that you can verify it. And if you behave yourself as I tell you, you won't get into any trouble. And if you don't, look out. <laughs> Good Lord. Just two minutes. One more book I recommend. A man named Robert Adolph. A-D-O-L-P-H. <coughs> it's called The Rise of Modern Prose Style. The title promises more than the book really contains. What it is, what it is, is a, a very scrupulous corrective to the excesses of Crow. And it takes him far too long to do it. He isn't as, he isn't as graceful a writer as Crowell, for one thing. I mentioned that Crowell pushed his discovery a bit far. Uh, his own editors in that uh, collection say so up front. As far as Crowell was concerned, after the Seneca re reaction, the Baroque reaction, all the rest, all subsequent history of style is just a series of variations on the Baroque. And that gets into trouble. It gets into bad trouble when you get down to the uh, late 17th century and the impact of empirical science, the, the so-called scientific revolution, the number, the number business. The Royal Society prose, is that a familiar phrase? Royal Society prose, we'll be coming to it. Um, Thomas Sprott, History of the Royal Society, 1667. A close, naked, and natural way of speaking. Positive expressions, clear senses. <coughs> Thus bringing all things as close to the mathematical plainness as they can, and preferring the language of artisans and merchants above that of wits and scholars. That's one of the most famous sentence about style in the English language. It has all kinds of interesting implications. Uh, Crow tried to sweep that into the Seneca camp, <coughs> and it can't be done. But, uh, and if you want to know why it can't be done, Mr. Adolph tells you. So that the story, what we're going to be investigating then in the next few weeks is the we we'll spend a little time on Ciceronian and Seneca, and then we we'll get to Sprott, his history, the empirical, the empirical impact, the so-called Royal Society prose. Sprott's history has got to be in the library somewhere. It's been, um, you don't need a first edition, it's been reprinted. It was reprinted in um, University of Missouri, I think, about 10 years ago. And that, that's the place where you encounter the impact of, of the empirical. 
when we get to it, as we will in a couple of weeks at some length with exhibits, I hope to persuade you that it isn't as simple even as it looks to Professor Adolf. Now, it turned out that when you say close, naked, and natural, you're talking about the Garden of Eden. <coughs> That's enough for today. <laughs> <laughs>